Hey guys, this is John and Patrick. No Austin today. And this is another episode of the Meatristics podcast brought to you by Walton's. So we've got a guest today. It's Greg Henderson from Drover's Magazine. Uh, Greg was nice enough to reschedule with us from last week's, what, technical debacle? Oh my gosh. What wasn't it? It just, it was very understanding of him. <laughs> uh, the service we used all of a sudden, I talked to him for about four seconds and then all of a sudden it sounded like I was underwater. That was and a, then, hey, pretty sweet four seconds. It was a good four <laughs> seconds. Now it's not quite as good as the 40 something minutes we did here. Uh, great interview. Really, really interesting guy has a lot of experience in the industry. He's been working at Drovers pretty much his whole career um, and has been covering the beef industry. So we got to talk about a lot of good things. So we'll kick you on over to that right now. So we have a guest with us here today. We've got Greg Henderson from Drovers Magazine. Uh, we've used numerous of Greg's articles from Drovers in the past during our Meat Matters segment. A couple of weeks ago, I was looking at uh, one of those articles and I thought, why don't we reach out to him? We need somebody on the podcast who actually understands this market. I can, can clear up some confusion from us. Plus, there are a few things that I'm really interested to get an insider or at least somebody who covers these markets um, fairly often. I would want to get their opinion on. So, Greg, thank you very much for one, being patient with us last week when we experienced technical difficulties, rescheduling with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan. It's quite great to be here. Well, we've been saying for a long time that we needed to get somebody with some expertise on the on the podcast, so we're glad uh, that we could actually make that happen. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions for you here today, and you know we sure. can feel free. We can make this as long or as short as we want. I know we both have a hard out in a little bit, uh, but we've got some time. Uh, the first question I want to bring up is not necessarily why we had you on the podcast, but it did come up in one of your articles, and I'm really interested in it or in your opinion on it, and that's electronic tags and what your opinion is on them. Uh, so you were referring to electronic identification tags and uh, traceability. So the beef industry is uh, uh, pushing towards a traceability platform, and it's really important because of uh, disease traceability for certain. So that's the overriding aspect of it. Um, so the figure I'm going to give you now is uh, a little bit old. It was done uh, research by a university, and I, I really don't remember which one, but they determined through their studies that at least 450,000 cattle have wheels under them at any one point in time, meaning they're on a truck or a trailer, going from an auction market to a feed yard to a ranch, you know, so at any one time, 450,000 cattle. So if you can imagine then, if we have an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease, how rapidly that could spread throughout the industry, right? So we need a, a traceability system and electronic ID, uh, ear tags are, are obviously the the higher technology way of doing that. But we need a, a system that is standard across the entire industry to help with that. Now, the next step with that would be um, for consumers who are saying they want to know more about where their food comes from. And increasingly, we're seeing the larger players in our industry like Walmart, Tyson, Costco, um, Amazon, even what they have, they now own Whole Foods. So they want, they're demanding more traceability from their suppliers. And so it seems like that is going to be pushed down the system to producers to comply and create some type of traceability system that satisfies the needs of those consumers. Do you see that as, uh, you said, use the word pushed down at the end there. Do you see this as a voluntary program or is this something that you think there's a chance so, is going to be mandated? Right now, we have a voluntary program in place. It's mm -hmm. just not very many people are using it, right? So if uh, the industry wants to uh, develop their own system and it's probably going to require... Um, mandatory to make it across the entire industry. But 
the industry, re, re, you know, they, they are resisting the mandatory. And if they do, what I think is going to happen, and this is my opinion only, uh, I think the bigger players are going to say, we want this traceability all the way back to the ranch. And if you don't want to volunteer, if you don't want to provide this voluntarily, then we don't want your cattle. So if you, in the future, and I'm not saying this is next year or three years from now, I don't know when this is going to happen, but I feel confident that at some point in time, if you want to sell cattle into the system that eventually winds up in Walmart or Costco or Kroger, the, the, you know, the, the bigger players, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have that system in place. So I've seen this, I've, I've been saying I've seen this coming for a while, not this specifically, but what I'm about to say, a bifurcation in the market. Um, I think we're going to see more people with the means uh, going directly to custom slaughter and getting more. Yeah, I know a lot of people do it now, uh, but I think it's going to become wider spread. People getting quarters, halves um, from a cow that they know the the rancher, the farmer that raised it, they know where they brought it to slaughter and they're going to take their meat from that. And then everybody else will go down, uh, you know, the the ones that go through the big four. Um, I I really do see that coming. Uh, I don't know if you, you noticed or not, but when you said some resistance, I smiled. Uh, there's a big part of this market uh, that is going to resist something like that just because naturally they are... Uh, resistant to being told to do anything. Um, I'm sure you're you're aware of what a lot of ranchers are like. Uh, some of them, you tell them to, <laughs> you tell them to do something. You, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the what I call the freezer beef direct cons, uh, uh, farm to consumer is going to increase, and in fact, it already is increasing. And so, um, before I. I don't want to be misunderstood because I'm the editor of a national beef publication and I am for anything that helps my readers um, sell more beef to be profitable. And whether that's direct consumer or or it's it's through the big system that's going through Tyson and Cargill to reach the masses. Um, my focus is entirely on uh, providing my readers with information that helps them be successful in my opinions and what drive uh, my information through my magazine and my website uh, is, in fact, uh, geared towards my readers. So it's a reader first mentality, if you will, from us. And I certainly agree in fact, my brother and I have, have sold uh, quite a bit of freezer beef since the pandemic. And um, we have a lot of repeat customers. People love it. Uh, it you know, it's, it's um, just as you say, they know where it came from. They feel good about it. And that's what we're after is uh, getting that consumer to feel good about what it is they're buying and feeding their families, Right. Absolutely. It is the saying, um, find the man with the blood on his hands. If you yes. want to find out where your beef is coming from, how it was treated. And I, I, I hesitate to say this to a certain amount because I've bought plenty of good steaks from you know our local grocery store, um, even the larger box stores like Sam's, Costco. Uh, but there is a higher quality of, of cut from the quarters and halves I buy directly from uh, one of our customers. It's just, it just is, it's treated better. Um, I, I know they've done the slaughtering the right way. I know the animal was ra or raised how I want it, finished how I want it. Um, so I just, I, I really do. I agree. I think that is where more of the market is going to go. I think a lot of, of what you're referring to, it, it, and I, I agree with what you just said, but I think in addition to that, there is, um, a growing um, number of people that are becoming more immersed in what they're buying to feed their family and they're, they're uh, educating themselves, they're researching it more. And um, I think they're, when they do that, 
then they find um, the direct consumer product fits what they're looking for more. Yep, absolutely. As long as you have the means, uh, meaning you know you have to have you're gonna you're gonna need a freezer chest. Um, you're gonna need a, a decent amount of you know disposable cash to buy it because uh, it's not necessarily cheap. I don't think it's it's just a large investment all at once. It is over the long term, it's cheaper than buying it at the grocery store. But I mean, it is a, a greater initial hit, obviously. Um, and then obviously, you need the knowledge and uh, the desire on how to prepare it correctly, right? Yes, so absolutely. But, so speaking of that, how long do you see it? We're at what the lowest levels of our herd since the 70s? So the actual beef cow number at 28.2 million January 1 of this year is the lowest number in 73 years. Going back to, I think it was 1951. So we're at the lowest number of actual beef cows. Now, there are roughly 9.8 million dairy cows in this country, which do not go into this, this number we're talking about. And the dairy cow number is relatively stable over the last 10, 20 years. But the beef cow number has been shrinking, and that was because of the drought that we had in 21, 22, 23. Yeah, it was specific, very hard hit here in Kansas, um, especially last year. We had an incredible drought and saw some really dramatic uh, footage coming out of some of the uh, the places here of just large numbers of dead cows that just couldn't keep them alive. So, um, and then we also uh, go ahead. There, there is a, there's a narrative going on in uh, I've seen it in some of the national media that we are quote in a crisis because of the beef supply. And I want to be clear that we are not in a crisis due to the supply the the number of cows is down um, significantly. That's true, but what they fail to to mention is that uh, when you look at this entire industry, uh, we're going to be down a billion pounds in production in 2024. That's a wow number until you realize that's a decline of about four percent. <laughs> so we, were, we we produced 27 billion pounds last year, and we'll produce 26 billion this year. The other thing that's the, that's a wow factor is we are producing nearly the same amount of beef as we did in 1973 with one third fewer cows. So yeah, that. That is so. What do you uh, uh, credit that to? Is that feedlots? Uh, is that so improvements in nutrition? That is a a combination of a lot of factors. Okay. Um, genetics would be the main one. The improved genetics from those cattle of the seventies to cattle now, and so we hear a lot about this word sustainability, right? And sustainability can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but increasingly people in agriculture are being asked to do things more sustainable uh, and to uh, consider their own environmental footprint. And to the people in agriculture, I think a lot of them see that as kind of a uh, kind of blue sky, you know, we're already sustainable. But if you look at that efficiency of those cows from the 70s to now, uh, we've, we're getting more efficient um, from from a standpoint of the feed efficiency of those animals. They they gain faster on less feed. Um, lots of management and technology improvements have uh, have affected that. And this is no different than the other aspects of agriculture, like corn production. Um, you know, from the seventies to now. The seed corn that we use is is drastically different, more drought tolerant, 
Uh, those are the technologies that, that we're using in agriculture to be more efficient and produce more food with less. And obviously, that's one of the reasons we're seeing um, farms get larger and people, a lot of people are, are, are not coming back to the farm. Uh, the the, the uh, number of farmers out there is, is declining, and it has been for 60 or 70 years. Do you have any thoughts on what's a driving factor in that? Yeah, you know, um, I think the big thing is um, just to be blunt that people, um, smart people that want to go to college don't necessarily want to go back to a farm. They okay. a, a, a lot more people, a lot of these uh, farmers, sons and daughters are finding that, hey, I went to college and got a degree. And uh, if I go back to the farm, um, you know, I'm going to be working 90 plus hours a week. And uh, um, and with really with the, with the way the, the farm income has gone the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, there's no guarantee that that what they're going to do back on the farm is going to be profitable. I think the the exit is just people don't want to work this or, or live the same lifestyle as their mm. parents on the farm have done. Now not there is also that, that, I'm not I'm not saying that's a bad lifestyle, and I I would say that um, when I was young I couldn't wait to get off the farm. And after I got older, I couldn't wait to go back to the farm. Right, so um, it's it, it it that I believe that that is the primary thing pulling, you know, people off the farm is jobs or in, in other places. There does also seem to be though a uh, a rise in uh, more and more people are having uh, a return to having a small herd of cows themselves right and i'm yes. talking five yes. to ten just yes. enough to sustain you know them their neighborhood whatever so but, but they've it could be that have it's money to do that or they've got to have an income off of that small farm to sustain that small farm correct they most of this is just living. side you know they can't put shoes on their kids feet with 10 cows oh, of course not no 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 um, do you have thoughts on uh, beef on dairy? Yeah. So uh, probably of all the things in the last 30 years, th this is one of the top five big changes to our industry. Um, so right now, I, I mentioned earlier, there's a little over 9 million dairy cows. Mm -hmm. And... We now have sex semen, meaning we can we can uh, have all heifer calves if we want to from those nine million cows. Uh, but to improve the genetics of those dairy cows, we don't need nine million heifer calves. We mate the the best cows to the best semen and, and get our heifers that way. So there's roughly three million cows right now that are being bred with beef semen, and that cross, that beef dairy cross calf, is much more efficient and a much higher quality beef product to go into the, 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 the feedlots and the beef system than those dairy calves were before. Uh, we're making a lot of progress there, and, and when we talked about Earlier, we talked about the decline in the beef cow herd. So it's at 28.2 million. Well, we need to factor in, we we're also bringing in 3 million dairy calves into that mix. So again, I, I said, we're not at a beef crisis and it's because of uh, technological and management advances such as the beef on dairy that's putting cattle back into the system uh, that maybe we were lost, that we lost to the drought over the last two or three years. Do you, what is it that makes them more efficient? 
Is it just genetics? The genetics make, yes, in, in, in a short word, yes. But the feed conversion that has been bred into the beef cattle um, over the last 30, 40 years, uh, we're constantly selecting for, um, you know, marbling, uh, carcass quality, feed efficiency, uh, those traits. And over time, we've, we've made a more efficient animal. Okay. Uh, it just, this is totally just an opinion question. Do you notice a large difference in finished quality? And when I say finished quality, I, I'm talking about after it's been cooked by the end user in grass fed or grass finished uh, steaks. Well, I think there are, a, a, there is a huge difference between grass finished beef and grain finished beef. Mm -hmm. And the taste of it, um, of either one, uh, is preference of the consumer. Okay. Um, and it also goes back to the attributes we were talking about earlier. Maybe a particular consumer feels better about eating a grass fed steak, uh, as opposed to a grain fed one. Maybe they, the, uh, way that animal was raised is more suitable to a particular consumer. I will say that if you are concerned about the environment and the impact cattle have on the environment, the grain fed steer has a lower impact than the grass fed steer. Really? And that may be surprising. That is very surprising. Can you Here's go into that a little reasons. bit? Here's the reasons. Um, Number one, an animal that is fed grain emits less methane than the grass-fed animal. And it does that um, for two reasons. Number one, it, it's, it just emits uh, less methane um, uh, from the grain diet than it does from the roughage diet. And number two, the grain-fed animal takes longer to get to finished weight, so it lives longer, uh, and therefore uh, it takes more of them to satisfy the production needs of that niche market. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Uh, I honestly would have assumed it was the exact opposite, but that's very, very interesting to hear. It, yep, per and, and uh, there are certainly uh, uh, there, there's plenty of research to back up what I just said, and I, I, I just give you an overview, obviously, and, and I'm not a scientist. I just have been reporting on this science for 35 years, right? So I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to give your listeners a, a place to go to watch a, a short five-minute video on methane and the professor's name is Frank Mittlenauer, and he uh, goes by the Twitter handle of GHG Guru, and he has, uh, he, he is the, he's a world-renowned scientist in the study of animal science and air quality at the University of California at Davis. Uh, there is a, the, there is a short video on YouTube that he has produced uh, called Clearing the Air on um, Methane. And uh, it really explains all of that uh, 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 about how methane, and obviously it is a greenhouse gas, right? But why is it, um, why is it more important than carbon in the atmosphere? So one of the things that he tells uh, is and, and has the science to back this up, but when you put methane into the atmosphere, it lasts about 10 years. So because of the recycling of the, uh, the, the, the elements and the, and the use, then that, that methane is only in the atmosphere about 10 years. So if you've got a 10,000 head feed yard, for example, that's been there 10 years, there's no new methane going into the atmosphere. Does that make sense? 
It does make sense because what you put in 10 years ago is going away. Right. And you're adding that around, if not that exact same amount. So it's just but recycled. When you talk about carbon, that lasts in the atmosphere for thousands of years. So when we drive our car, we're not getting that back out of the atmosphere. I mean, the, the, the Earth's recycling system is not going to bring that back in our lifetime, right? Right. So anyway. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. Um, all right. So it's Frank Mittlenhauer and the GHG guru. Yes. Okay. Uh, I will put that in the notes. Uh, we, we post this on our uh, Meatgistics channel, uh, which is uh, our website when, as well. So when I'll, we finish, I'll put that. I'll send you a link to that, um, to that video. It's, it's really worth five minutes of your time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, cause that's not anything I'd ever heard before. Uh, and I, you know, I pay more attention to this than most people since we're at least tangentially, uh, related to that industry. Um, so I, I'm surprised that I had never heard that before. Okay. So I will definitely watch that. Can we, can we talk, uh, since we're on this subject, uh, yep. one of the subjects that has come up this week is uh, you've heard about the wildfires in the Texas and Oklahoma pan out, right? Yes. And there is starting to be a narrative that cows um, were actually part of the problem uh, there. Um, and in fact, what happened and, and, and the cause of these wildfires is because they had a pretty good growing season in that particular region. In other words, uh, you go south of the Kansas line down into the panhandle of Texas last year, they had above average rainfall last year. So they have a lot of grass production. So there was a lot of fuel for those fires. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And the way to control that is not have so much fuel, right? Because we know in the spring we're going to, have those high winds and and those fires can can take off like they did. Um, grazing is one of the ways to lessen that fuel load and uh, uh, reduce that danger of fire. Okay, that definitely does make sense. Um, I haven't haven't really seen uh, too much coming out saying that. Uh, how are they trying to phrase it that cattle were part of this problem? Because that doesn't. So it's compete. it's an over overarching impact that they are claiming because uh, cattle are you know the argument that cattle are bad for the environment in general and the overstatement that cattle produce um, more greenhouse gases. Uh, cattle and agriculture are responsible for uh, twelve to fifteen percent of all. GHGs uh, it, it sent into the atmosphere. Um, that's kind of a false narrative in itself because mm -hmm. our own EPA says um, agriculture is responsible for about three to five percent, not 12 to 15 percent. So, you yeah, I've seen the 12 to 15 percent number, I've seen it listed as high as 20 something percent. Yes. yes. Um, that yeah, usually is referring to worldwide. Is that correct? It is referring to worldwide, and remember, um, the um, uh, American agriculture is much more efficient, so we burn less fossil fuel getting our crops in and out. Um, the animals are more efficient. We need fewer of them to produce the products that we need. Um, so, yes. Uh, moving somewhat on, um when we're looking at the cost of uh, cattle at market, yeah. um, one of the main questions, I, well, a couple of main questions I have, how have ranchers survived the last three, four years when it seems like constantly every head is a loss? Are there other revenue streams that come in that we're just not aware of? So I, I would challenge a little bit. Uh, so sure, please. The, uh, the fact that um, ranchers, every animal's a loss is not quite right, not true. Okay. And uh, we did our own survey last year 
uh, and we called it the state of the beef industry. And we surveyed our readers uh, to ask questions. Um, I'll give you some examples here. 65% of the people we surveyed said they are optimistic about the future. And 57% of those reported profitability in the last five years. So 54% of them say they'll add a member, a family member to their operation within the next five years. And that 38% said that they will, a third of, more than a third, are going to grow the size of their operation. So if you look at the at, at beef producers, ranchers, uh, and I tell people they're different than dairy operators and uh, and pork operators in that a, a ranch has more land, Gen in, generally speaking, typically there's more land involved. And that land, as we know, has gotten extremely um, risen in price over the last 30, 40 years. So ranchers tend to have more equity than okay. other parts of agriculture simply because they own more land. Now, sometimes that, that land may not be as valuable as, as farmland in Iowa. I get that. But uh, that equity is what has allowed a lot of people to withstand a lot of the financial troubles over the last 30, 40 years. And in addition to that, I would say that uh, because they have that equity and they also have equity in those cows, um, meaning they don't owe a lot of money on those cows for the most part. Um, and, and profitability, uh, while it was tight in 20 and 21, I think there were people making a little money. Uh, the economic people that we use suggest that uh, profits were, you know, 75 to to $100 per head. In 2021, they're going to $400 to $500 per head here in 24. Okay. Let me give you one so, more piece of information that I think is really interesting. So in 2022, a 500-pound steer, so in other words, a, a calf right off the cow weighing 500 pounds, he sold for around $2.05 and, and a pound, making that calf worth $1,025. To put that in perspective, a semi-load of those calves, 50,000 pounds of those calves is worth $102,500. The same truckload, two years later, in 2024, is worth $160,000. So those prices are up 35% in the last two years. Just kind of perspective on on the value of those animals i mean that's very interesting obviously that's very good to hear um you know you you hear we, we try to do our best to realize that there is a narrative out there that's pushed often and it is a negative agriculture and specifically for whatever reason it seems like the beef industry is always or the you know the ranchers are always on the end of it um that this is unsustainable, that these uh, things are going away anyways. So why don't we just hurry up and do it? Um, so it's good to hear that that is definitely not the case. Um, one of my questions on that, though, would be, so they have the equity in their land, they have some equity in the animals as well. But when that ranch goes to change hands, they're going to be taxed on that. Is that correct? I mean, there is a, a, a quote unquote death tax applied to these ranches, or is that somehow handled um, through legal means? The inheritance tax is only comes into play when a ranch is worth, I don't know the exact figure, I think it's $6 million. So that, Oh, it, okay. So most of the ranches are not going to fall into that. I know the, the industry has campaigned for a long time to do away with the inheritance tax, um, and I, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that it doesn't affect most ranches. That's ex I never knew that. So that's really good to know. Um, when we're talking about the price a cattle is going to receive at market, 
between the, these two factors, what would you say uh, factors in more? Is it cost of what it, or I should say the profitability, is it demand or is it the cost of feed to get that animal up to market weight? Does my question make sense? I can try no, and rephrase what, it. Okay. Uh, rephrase your question for me, please. Okay. Um, when we're looking at the profitability per head yes. of animal, yes. what what plays more of a, 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 a driving force in that? Is that the demand for more cattle or is it the cost of coming down on the feed that it takes to get that animal so if up you, to So if you're talking about uh, demand from feed yards uh, to buy yes. those calves, so mm -hmm. we can, you know, we tell our readers all the time, you can increase the demand for your animals if you provide the feed yard exactly what they're looking for. So one of those things may go back to this traceability that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation. But feed yards want, if, if they're going to buy your calf um, and they know some history about that animal, it makes them worth more. So in other words, if we know that that animal has been uh, weaned uh, from the cow uh, for more than 45 days, that adds some value because I'm not going to have to deal with a balling um, mama sick calf. Uh, and right. they're more likely to get sick. So if that animal's been vaccinated for the primary uh, respiratory diseases, uh, that's going to increase its value too. We call that preconditioning those calves and getting them ready for market. And we know that we can add value. And, and researchers over the last 15 years has proven that we can increase sales by 5 to $10 per hundred weight if we do preconditioning of calves. And uh, so that could add uh, 50 to 60, sometimes $75 uh, per animal to the sales price of those kids right off the cow. Because the feed yard knows that when they get to the feed yard, they're going to be healthier. They're going to be more efficient gainers. Um, and I'm just going to have a lot less problems with them. And I'm going to be able to get them to market faster. So... So how does the uh, electronic tag let the uh, feed yard know that it's been however long since this animal was weaned, that it's received these uh, vaccinations? How is that data transferred so, to an electronic tag? Because my understanding, go ahead. So th there, there's a small percentage of ranchers, larger ranchers, obviously. There's a small percentage of them that are working directly with feed yards and using uh, RFID tags that they can enter this data in when they run them uh, and when they process them at the ranch saying, you know, this is Kef number 27. He's had these three vaccines, um, you know, whatever else. And they can, they can uh, enter that data into uh, the chip that's on the ear tag. Okay. And okay. So, so it, it is the feed yard, and then the feed yard's obviously got to have its own reader. But when that number twenty-seven calf runs through the chute, and I read that ear tag, that chip, I know exactly. And even more than that, I can, if if I want to, with this new technology, I can put the genetics of that animal. Was it sired by a Hereford bull, Angus bull? Um, Simmental bull, I can even get more detailed. Um, you know, which one of those bulls? Is that a high marbling bull? Is that a high uh, birth weight bull? Obviously, the computers allow us to put all of that data with that calf. Now, I, it, all of that's true. I'm just saying there's not very many people doing that yet. But there will be more because it helps them make money. So before we had this, uh, no one was doing that with like paper trails? Right. Huh. Okay. Yes. That's interesting. So it's really, it's a new, um, not just a new technology, but also a new technology allowing us a new process to, or to give more information. Sure. 
on the animal. Okay. And there's enough trust between uh, the feeding yards and the ranchers that even though I'm just entering this on the computer, this is actually what happened to this animal? Well, yes. And it, okay. it's like um, whatever business you're in, if you're in the car business or the clothing business, if you want repeat customers, you have to provide a quality product and quality service. Correct. So if I'm a rancher, uh, you know, I can put on that chip, you know, all this stuff that was done. But if they don't see results on the other end, they're not going to come back next year and buy my calves because they don't believe what I did. So that's where the honesty's got to come in. And there's even audits that, uh, you know, third party audits that you can do. Um all of that stuff adds cost, I understand. But uh, what they're finding is that uh, the value to the feed yard, and especially if the rancher wants to partner with the feed yard on those cattle and gain some of the profits that are made down the chain, um, they're going to work together. They're going to partner together. We often, or I often at least, think of that as an almost adversarial relationship. Is Am I looking at that all wrong? So increasingly, it is becoming less of an adversarial relationship. And the reason I say that is because more ranchers are, are retaining a little ownership, let's say, uh, of their kids down through the chain. Because they know that um, there's more value being added to them. And especially if, if I've worked hard to improve the genetics of my cattle. And when those cattle are sold from the feed yard today, a lot more of them are sold on a quality and carcass basis. And so if I reach quality standards like 80% choice or better, and I know the feed yard's getting a premium for producing 80% choice cattle. I want to participate in that. So maybe I partner with the feed yard. So um, there's less and less of an adversarial relationship between the feed yard and the cow calf. Well, well, I mean, that's excellent news to hear, to be honest. Um, that's, that's a good thing, I think, for the industry. Yes. Um, just, so I know you have a, a, a out here. I'm actually over when I was supposed to be out, but we were having such a good conversation. I have one more question sure. um, to ask you, and we didn't plan on on this at all, but I did want to follow up. One of the first things I, I really remember seeing your name on was uh, years ago, you reported on a Tennessee rancher whose cattle was taken from him without a warrant. Oh, yes. Do you remember yes, that at all? Do you, um, have you any updates on that? What I happened? I don't have any. Up, well, okay. I, I think that w was resolved in that uh, he won a judgment from the sheriff's office. Um, and I also think that he moved from the county that that happened in to a neighboring county to start over. Uh, but um, the cattle that you're talking about were confiscated uh, uh, because of uh, um, animal abuse, I believe was the charge or, or at least the claim. Uh -huh. And it turns out the animals were not being abused um, That um, and, and that they came and took those cattle without first securing a warrant. That's where the sheriff's office right. um, um, made their mistake. And that's what led to the judgment. And, he, I think, uh, memory serves me correctly, he was acquitted uh, in court, or at least the charges were dropped. The uh, charges of abuse were, were unfounded. Yeah, is that something that you find that ranchers are worried about at all? You know, I've heard more and more people tell me that as, uh, as suburbia expands into rural areas, um, Sometimes these uh, suburbanites will see animals that they don't know what's going on with them, and they 
call in, you know, possible abuse when that none is, is actually there. Like, um, you know, they don't always understand the feeding regimen of, of the cattle and how they're being cared for. And, and frankly, they don't often recognize an abused animal if they saw one, right? Right. Yep. Uh, people moving out of the cities, in my mind, uh, is a, a great thing. Um, but it does cause some friction between the people who've lived out in the country for a long time uh, and people who are newer I to think it. The for biggest sure. thing, uh, the biggest concern I have, uh, and and as people, you know, come into the area where my brother and I have our um, uh, place, is that they want the city people want to treat their new land, whether it's 10 acres or 40 acres or 160 acres, like it was their backyard, you know, keep out. Well, uh, in rural settings, that's not always possible. Cattle get out, you know, um, things happen and you just can't, uh, you just can't protect it like it was your, your uh, backyard, if that. Oh, I have a friend who, who has about uh, 15 acres and has a donkey that is an escape artist. It, it doesn't matter what you do. We've repaired fences, you've done everything, but that buttercup finds a way out and her, you know, new to the country neighbors are always calling saying, your donkey's out again. It's like, well, I mean, it's, it's a donkey. It's, you know, it's not coming for you. It's not doing any damage. I'll get it and bring it back. It's not that big a deal, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that play out. Um, Greg, do you have anything you want to uh, uh, talk about uh, as far as Drover's Magazine? No, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to you know, to talk about this. Uh, uh, I would tell people if they want to see what we do, uh, we're at drovers.com. Uh, we're a, Drovers is a 150-year-old brand, um, and I've been fortunate to spend almost my entire career with Drovers, so... Um, look us up. That's excellent. And we'll link to uh, the uh, the Frank Mittlenhauer uh, video and, of course, uh, Drover's Magazine as well on our, our Meatistics podcast. Sure. Thank you so Thank much. You. God, that interviewer is ugly. <laughs> Remember when he was thin and good looking? Oddly, yeah. I was going to say familiar, but I, there's something about his face. It's I'm almost like sure. he got fat injected into his face. <laughs> like he did the opposite of Ozempic. Oh, okay. He did... Mozempic. It's just you're gonna get mo bigger. <laughs> Speaking of getting mo bigger, we went out and got oh my God. Arby's. The unra- the so anytime thing. Patrick and I go on the road, we n- normally get Arby's because I don't eat it much and I love it. Yeah, I don't eat it at all either. No, no, never. <laughs> never even had. What is this? Am I saying it right? Arby's. Oh, That's pretty interesting. Uh, so I just got a classic double. Patrick got a beef and cheddar. Double, double beefy, double beef and cheddar, baby. <laughs> Here's the. Part. I know it's not real meat. I know there's something added to it, but it's so delicious, especially when it's still nice and warm. Oh man, every like it's sh- when they shave it correctly. I've had it sometimes where I'm just like, it's it's too thick. You got to be able to see through it. You know, the They've roast beef. Got to bring five for five back. Oh, they they lose so much money. I now. know. Especially compared to every, nothing's five dollars anymore. No, I know, dude. The mac and cheese bites that came with four—that's five dollars, and they're the size of hush puppies from like Long John Silver. So that's just insane. Price of all food has gone nuts, but especially fast food. I saw something the other day that said uh, a family of four at McDonald's oh, is no. now like a seventy-dollar meal. Oh, like they actually get what you and want. It's right. Like if they get a uh-huh. drink, you get the meal, and then like a McFlurry or something, right? So it's each, correct. Each person's like thirteen to eighteen. Yeah, just get a Big Mac meal. If you go large, it's like twelve something. Yeah, that's fine. They go medium or large. I go, what's it come regular? Small. I go, oh, I thought you guys weren't allowed to do that. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Then just large. Give me all of the food. <laughs> Give me all of the food. Morgan Spurlock said they can't supersize stuff, anymore. but they can, or they do. Um, All right, so that's it. Uh, Arby's is amazing. We will see you guys next week. See ya. Thanks for checking out the Meatistics Podcast. To shop everything but the meat, head on over to Waltons.com. 
To get your meat processing questions answered by experts and enthusiasts alike, head on over to our online community at MeatGistics.com. Walton's, everything but the meat.